Hi there, I'm Rebecca and a really warm welcome back to my channel, Pumpkin Becky. It's the 20th of June 2020, that makes it the summer solstice, the longest day of the year and the astrological first day of summer. And we're going to celebrate by taking a look at progress in the square foot garden. Let's get started. Let's take a moment just to reintroduce you to my very well-worn, well-loved copy of Mel Bartholomew's book, Square Meter Gardening. It's one of the updates of his square foot gardening system. You may know that we actually built our own house and that meant that we started off with a completely blank canvas in the garden. We knew we wanted to have certain things. We knew we wanted to keep chickens. We knew we wanted to have vegetables and fruit in the garden. We also knew we wanted to have a fairly fairly extensive ornamental garden. We wanted a greenhouse. We wanted a shed. And so we put all of those things down on a plan and we thought about where it was all going to go and how it was all going to fit in. Actually, that's a complete lie. We built our entire garden around our three-seater swing seat. No, honestly, we did know we wanted all those things in the garden. We wanted it to be really multifunctional. We, we wanted to have guinea pigs able to graze on the grass. We wanted to be able to grow things earlier and in a more protected way. So we needed a greenhouse, which we'd never had before. But we only had front garden, back garden and the house, the land the house stood on in total is 0.1 of an acre. So we have to do our best to use that space as effectively as possible. So part of that trying to maximise our space was knowing how to grow vegetables in a garden setting. We'd had an allotment the spacing sort of was completely flummoxed me because we'd, we'd made our raised beds to the sizes that people had said were a really good size to make them to, but then found we could only get two rows of things in maximum, so we weren't really maximising the space. So we designed the garden and we had identified the space immediately outside the kitchen window as the best place probably to put the kitchen garden, knowing that we would just be able to step out of the back door go and harvest something and then go and cook it straight away. It would be in view of the kitchen sink so you'd be able to see how things were progressing and therefore inform what we were going to have for dinner that day. Yeah. Yeah. This illustration is a, a cross section of what our square foot beds look like. We've made them three squares, three feet wide by I think it's 12 squares, square feet long, so in total it's 72 square feet I think, two beds. So this is a cross section, so we have about 30 centimetres depth from the patio level up to the top of the raised bed wall. They are a brick construction which means that they are really robust. We're not going to have to rebuild them every five years. We've done them out of timber like we did at the allotment. Then inside the bed we have and it's about 10, 10 to 12 centimetres depth of what's called Mel's mix and we'll look at that in a minute and that is the soil component of the bed. And then we have a layer of sand to give us a bit of an extra depth. We've then placed a weedproof membrane in which we bought up on all sides to try and sort of contain the soil and sand component and that all sits on top of a layer of gravel and it's 10 mil to 20 mil graded. So that's here and all of that sits on top of our normal soil level. Mel Bartholomew who designed square foot gardening was a civil engineer and he went to help on a community garden and he got quite frustrated with the 
what he saw as a waste of growing space by using conventional practices, I suppose. This happened in 1975. Conventional farming practices back then, not backyard growing or kitchen gardening, but farming practices, said that you always planted your crops three feet apart, whatever that crop might be. It's always rows of three foot gap. I'm going to use this this bed size, which is 90 centimetres by 120 centimetres, or three foot by four foot, as the basis for all the calculations we're about to do. So using farming practices, the rows will be 90 centimetres apart. And in this example, we're using carrots. And seed packets say thin them to three inches, which is seven and a half centimetres ish on centre. So if you had a bed that was three foot wide, you would literally get one row of carrots before you could then have your your next row down here somewhere. Three feet. That's crazy. So essentially you end up with 16 carrots in 1.1 meter square of growing space. If you look at Mel's original concept for this, he wanted you to end up with 100% of the harvest for 50% of the cost, 10% of the water used, 5% of the seeds used and 2% of the work needed as opposed to traditional farming techniques. Now that might have worked back in 1975 but I think now practices have changed so much that it slightly debunks what he said but it also doesn't. In the square meter square foot method you take that three foot by four foot and you divide it with a permanent very visible grid system. Mine is battening which is screwed together into a, a grid and laid on top of the soil surface permanently. I prefer using a timber grid as opposed to another recommended method which is let's say you've got a timber raised bed screwing screws at every foot distance and then stretching a string across between them and forming your grid that way for some reason optically I can't cope with that gap between the strings at the top of the bed and the soil surface which surface which is usually some way down off that. I prefer my grid to be on the soil surface. Yes it's now started to rot but we filled these beds in 2014 and we're here in 2020 so I think that's pretty good going. In, with square foot gardening rather than thinking in terms of rows at a regimented rate and then thinning within that row Mel takes the thinning space and applies it all round the plant. So let's take one of these squares, 30 centimetres by 30 centimetres, one foot by one foot, and look at it in more detail here. By taking the distance that you're meant to thin a carrot to and applying it all the way around the plant, you can actually end up with 16 carrots in one square. Not 16 carrots for a whole bed, which is 1.1 meters, you actually end up with 16 carrots in 0.1 meters of growing space. Each carrot is still seven and a half centimeters away from its neighbor and its neighbor. You're still using the same spacing. You've just lost that row mentality. Let's fast forward to 2020. Gone are the days of using farming practices in the back garden. Seed companies have adapted their spacings to that backyard growing. And, and let's face it, it's actually in their interest because they want to sell you more seed and you are using more seed. I went on the internet and I looked up the growing instructions for uh, a random packet of carrots. Uh, I wasn't worried about who the supplier was or what type of carrot it was or what season it was. 
any of that business. I just, right, there's my carrots. And the instructions on the packet said, sow in rows 30 or 15 centimeters apart, and then thin the seedlings to 7.5 centimeters. So we're, we're still sticking with that 7.5 centimeters. If you were working at the 30 centimeter spacing, you would be able to get three rows of carrots, 30 centimeters apart, 15 centimeters off the edge of the bed, three rows of 16 carrots. So in that space, you've already tripled the amount of carrots that you can grow in modern terms compared to 1975. And if you went for the smaller spacing, 15 centimeters, instead of being able to grow 48 carrots, which is 16 times three, you'd actually be able to grow 96 carrots, six rows of 16 carrots. And you'd still have your 15 centimeters at the top and bottom and 15 centimeter gaps between. However, if you took that same bed and you turned it into a square foot garden and you had 16 carrots per square, you would end up with 192 carrots instead of your maximum 96 carrots in this method. That's enough of the maths. Now let's think about the soil and how it's going to cope with that level of production. Mel advocates using a mixture, equal quantities of garden compost, coarse vermiculite, and the third item he advocates is a 100% peat moss. When the book was revised, he did then make recommendations for peat-free alternatives, uh, maybe using coir, uh, other peat-free composts. The purpose of the vermiculite is a strange one. Not only does it help drainage, but it also helps retain moisture. But I suspect it was included as a soil component to help places that are drier than we are. I certainly find that my beds stay very damp. The sand beneath the mills mix is also allowing drainage but also retaining water. It also gives me an extra depth. Mel suggests that 15 centimetres of soil component, i.e. his mills mix, is enough for growing in and he even talks about keeping raised beds not much deeper than that for most crops. However, if you want to grow things like parsnips and carrots, you are going to need extra soil depth. And he says that rather than filling those beds with more of the mel's mix, you can add that extra depth with a layer of sand at the bottom. And in effect, that's what we've done. We've created 18 to 20 centimeters worth of total soil depth, the mel's mix with the sand on the bottom. And I've still got eight centimetres worth of head height before you get to the top of the brick raised bed. So I've got room to add depth if I want to. The idea is that you have your soil set up in your raised beds with your grid and you sow your crops or you transplant your crops depending on what's best for you. And you grow it, harvest it, and then as soon as you harvest it, you are adding a little bit more compost, a few handfuls, and then you are planting your next crop in. We've been growing in our Mel's Mix for f six years now, and they say five years is about its limit before you need to take it out and replace it. Well, because I don't think I need any more vermiculite in there, and there is a natural decomposition of the soil components, what I've decided this year, I've bought a bulk bag of peat-free compost and I am starting to add that in larger quantities to the bed so that I can raise the level a little bit and boost the fertility level a lot as well. For the really hungry crops, I am also adding farmyard manure as I go along as well. So here we have the two main raised beds. In total, it's 72 square feet of garden space. You can see what I was saying about the brick raised bed wall. It's double skin, which gives it more strength. And then there is a capping brick that runs in the opposite direction 
to the main courses of bricks just to give it that rigidity. It is wide enough for me to sit on and weed, harvest. I can also kneel on this and reach further across the bed too. This bed I can actually walk around the whole of it outside. The other bed I can only get to two sides of, one long side, one short side. The far side has a fence up against the wall and the other end has the apple tree in its much taller raised bed. Let's take a look at this first bed. The first thing to mention is my grid, my wooden grid. It is starting to look a little bit sorry now but it is still clearly marking each of the squares that I plant into. The tall plants here are sweet corn and you saw me sowing those into pots. You will notice however that I've only got seven plants now and that's because the two that I put in these front beds just did not thrive. don't know what was going on when I pulled them out. There was very little root left on them. They were just as nice and healthy as the others but they just didn't make it. And I may just have to help the pollination process as the season goes on just by shaking them near each other just to uh, help that pollen spread around. So having taken out the dying sweet corn plants, in this square I've got four dwarf French bean plants which have just gone in. They're looking fairly happy. This is purple teepee and I've also gone a bit overboard with some beetroot here. Um, I've been watching Charles Dowding and his no-dig methods and his idea of block planting beetroot and the fact that they actually like to be sown as a clump so I'm just giving that a go in this particular square here. This is my kale midnight sun which I planted out and I think I showed to you in an earlier video. It's doing okay but it is being slightly demolished by slugs. Kale as it goes through the season will develop a tougher leaf and will become less attractive to slugs. So we've just kind of got to get through this first step. These have been in the ground for a couple of weeks now. They put on a lot of growth since then so <laughs> fingers crossed. The square in front was five spinach plants. It's now one spinach plant in the middle which is trying to bolt and a pathetic little specimen next to it. I think I'm going to have those out and do something else with that square. I'm not having a huge amount of success with my onions this year. They did so well in their module trays and then when I planted them out we got hit by a really really hot period and they sort of stopped growing. Uh, as you can see the, the leaves are pathetic. Um, there's next to no bulb development. We've got more French beans, dwarf French beans and more onions along the front. The fronts of this bed tend to get more sunlight than the back. At the back these nice lush beasties are my parsnips doing really nicely. There's lots of them. Hurrah! Another square of French beans and some more onions. The wall that you can see here at the end is the raised bed that the apple tree is planted into and at the end of the bed here is a wall of peas. We should have six squares here with asparagus in. For some reason we've only got asparagus happening in these five beds. That sixth one hasn't done anything this year. Um, I'm going to keep going with it. I've earthed it up, I've given it some manure. Um, it, it feels good, it's got the signs of growth but it just hasn't actually produced anything. So we'll give it a chance. Summer solstice is traditionally when you stop harvesting asparagus, even if you've got spears coming up like I have here. 
it needs to regenerate itself for next year if you just keep cropping 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 you will exhaust the crown so that's no good starting to take over the asparagus is a plot of crown prints really exciting i love crown prints so much i can't, oh, can't wait this is hurst green shaft peas this is autumn crown squash they've all put lots of growth on since they came out one there. I only planted courgette zucchini out yesterday. Lots more onions. The trouble with onions is if you buy in sets like I tend to do, you get a bag of 50 and you can only put four per square so that really does tend to fill up my square foot beds quite quickly. I think next year I'm actually going to grow from seed because I'm fed up with this sort of thing happening, it's sort of stalling. I've got a feeling that if I grow just from seed I can get better results from my onions. I'm pretty sure this beastie is a spring cabbage. Somebody has kindly pulled the label out for me. <laughs> it certainly hasn't um, tried to heart up and so I intended to pull the leaves as spring greens. I got myself some Enviromesh in an attempt to keep out some carrot root fly. These are courgette sunstripe, those are their yellow ones, one and another one. Got an empty square there. Some carrots here. Behind that are some rainbow beetroot, which I have spaced out to, I think there's nine plants there. And that is squash red curry, which I bought as a plant and it's kind of sulking a little bit and the slugs are trying to get at it. I need to, uh, I don't know, do something about that. Around the other side, here are some beetroot at a later stage in development. So it's starting to get a little bit of bulbing up happening there. Again, these are the rainbow beetroot, so these are going to be a mixture of white, red. I think there might be choggier in there as well, so the stripy ones. Now I have learned something this year. Um, when an onion thinks it is ready and it wants to get harvested, it will do what this one is doing and it will bend over at the neck. This one is not ready for harvesting, it's just being a pain. And you will find that the leaves can tend to do that too, uh, certainly if they've gone through a period of stress or lots of heat and then rain or cold it will it will upset the plant and it will try and think about maybe going to seed but instead of folding over down here it will fold over to higher up the leaf and you can pinch that top out to stop it sending the message back to the bulb that it is time for harvest and you can eat that and treat it just like a spring onion chop it into things. You can see how stressed these onion sets have got. Uh, they've even done something really peculiar here where the, the leaves are getting stuck inside. So I've been going around sort of splitting the leaves open to allow the new healthier ones to come out. It's, uh, it's a bit of a mess. Like I say, I might give seed a go next year rather than just doing um, from sets. Apparently the results are better. I hear a lot of things like, because an onion is biennial, 
uh, it will want to put up its vegetation in one year and then the following year it's going to want to go to flower and so there is some thinking that when the sets are treated to stop them growing in their first year and they are then harvested to become sellable sets the plant is already being triggered to try and go to flower and it will never properly develop maybe that just depends where you get your onion from I mean in previous years I've had no issue at all this this year's just gone really weird and I've got so many curly whirly onion leaves it's not true inside this cage of four canes and some string is a set of broad beans growing one square's worth they were being predated by aphid particularly black fly so they have had a squirting with washing up liquid and water just a dot of washing up liquid inside a squirty bottle of water you don't need much at all and suddenly they are much cleaner than they were here's my hanging basket of tumbling tomatoes that we planted up a couple of weeks ago they have put on lots of growth and we've got flowers setting I'm also utilizing containers to increase my growing space so here I've got a pot of climbing French beans I've given them a very tall wigwam to get up and they're but they're right down there at the moment and here is the area between the two square foot beds so down here I've got my leeks grown from seed they're coming along really nicely hopefully you will by now have watched my video about these Haxnicks carrot planters as you saw in the other bed I had got some EnviroMesh so I cut a piece off that was going to be big enough to cover here some years ago I bought a really cheap fleece tunnel from Wilkinson's I think the fleece didn't last much longer than one winter but I still had the hoops left so I decided to pop those down into the corners and that's just giving me some headspace here over the top of the carrots so I've got two rows in each planter as you can see germination not too shabby got a little bit of a gap there but eventually as the season goes on these will get thinned anyway they are doing really nicely they look very happy something I realized once I'd planted these was that actually the problem I was having in the greenhouse was that the soil surface was drying out too much for germination to happen I was trying not to get them too soggy and I was watering from the bottom letting it wick up but carrots actually want the soil surface to be damp which I've been growing carrots for years and I hadn't realized that before with these planters I've made sure whilst germination was happening the soil was kept moist I've had a very simple ambition of growing lettuce here in the square foot beds <laughs> it really doesn't sound like it should be that hard does it but the slugs are a problem in the beds doesn't really seem to matter what I do uh, I have this year bought some nematodes which I will be watering on but they're not due to come till July so I thought why don't I look for a raised bed on legs that might be a bit less attractive to slugs and I found this from Veg Trug. this is their Poppy Go comes flat pack and it's got this felt liner, velcroed 
onto the structure and I'm going to get about three rows of, of lettuce out of it. Most of the ones I've got in there at the moment are from an oriental mix and then I've got some rather special lettuce seeds coming very soon which I'm looking forward to planting in there too. I've popped a couple of hoops into the ends of this as well though to be honest that it's probably not necessary. I was just trying to distract the birds from digging them up. And then last but not least in the square foot bed area I've got my borlotti beans. Which are growing really well. I have just pinched the tops out because they're getting pretty tall and that should encourage more shoots to come from the base and hopefully that way more beans. More beans. I've still got plants growing in the greenhouse. There's some squash, there's more kale plants just in case these ones don't make it. Uh, I think I've got Cavalinero going. I've also got some um, cabbage and sprouting broccoli coming along. I've got some more peas. There's lots happening and I'm looking forward to getting these new lettuces come through as well. They should be here next week I think. So that's exciting. Now I did have a question from a viewer as to how many carrots I thought I was going to get out of these Hacknicks planters see whether it was worth her while getting them. <sighs> I've just had a quick count up and I reckon I've got about 120 to 130 carrot seedlings germinated which compared to my previous attempt at germinating carrots <laughs> we're doing really well. Bear in mind though that not all those carrots will go on to become full-grown mature carrots like you'd buy in the shop, you know, some big, big carrots. We're going to need to harvest some of the, the ones in between as the season progresses so that we are thinning to that seven and a half centimetre spacing that we talked about right at the beginning and that will allow those plants to grow on and it means that you can have a harvest of the intermediate ones and eat the baby carrots that you get as a result. I'll continue to do updates on this Hacksnicks planter duo and uh, we'll see how we get on. Right, that's it for this week's video. Thank you so much for watching. Please remember to rate, share and subscribe to me here on YouTube. And until next time, goodbye.